Hello, I am Dr. Jim Powell, here to talk about whether scientists could be wrong about man-made global warming. After all, as scientists are the first to admit, we have been wrong before. But can you think of a profession that has not been? Take medicine. Doctors used to bleed patients, apply leeches, amputate as their option of choice, and refuse to wash their hands. But when my doctor today makes a diagnosis and recommends a treatment, do I say, no thank you, you doctors have been wrong before? Of course not. Because I know doctors didn't stay wrong. They learn from their mistakes. So have scientists. Let's look at the four different ways scientists have been mistaken in the past and ask whether any could apply to man-made global warming today. These overlap to some extent, but I believe it is useful to separate them. The first way I call the surprise. Sometimes a single unexpected fact can reveal that a theory or finding that almost all scientists in a field accept is wrong. The discovery of radioactivity is one of the best examples. During the second half of the 19th century, almost all scientists accepted the calculation by the world's most famous and accomplished physicist, Lord Kelvin, that the Earth is no more than 100 million years old. To arrive at this figure, Kelvin assumed that the Earth was born molten and had been cooling ever since, and, most importantly, that the Earth has no source of heat other than that left over from its fiery beginning. Then, in 1896, came the surprising and serendipitous discovery that atoms spontaneously emit subatomic particles and change into atoms of other elements. Madame Curie named it radioactivity. Soon her husband, Pierre Curie, found that each radioactive decay event releases heat. Since the Earth has gazillions of atoms, each decaying and releasing heat, Kelvin's assumption of only original heat was wrong, and therefore so was his results. Soon scientists began to use radioactivity to measure the absolute age of the Earth which today we know is 4.5 billion years. Our question is whether some new discovery, some surprise like radioactivity, could turn up to invalidate the science of global warming. No one can say it is impossible, but given all the advances in science since Kelvin's day, the likelihood of some new physical process like radioactivity being discovered is too small to depend on. Instead, if there were some startling new discovery that would offset or eliminate the threat of global warming, it would likely come in the form of a new or enhanced negative climate feedback. Consider first the example of a positive feedback. Ice reflects most incoming sunlight, while ocean water absorbs most of it. As warming seawater melts floating sea ice, Less sunlight is reflected and more is absorbed, causing the temperature of the water to rise further, which melts more ice, and so on and so on. But what we need to find is a negative feedback that would gradually shut global warming down. Here is a mundane example of a negative feedback, your toilet tank. As water fills the tank, the float gradually rises and shuts off the valve that admits the water. The more water in the tank, the less it enters until finally none enters. For decades, scientists have been looking for a significant negative feedback that, as the world warms, would gradually dampen or even eliminate global warming. But they have never found one. It's not impossible that they will someday, but to count on it would be foolish. The second way scientists could be wrong is what I call the false assumption. Often scientists do not have as much information as they need, and in order to make progress, have to make an assumption and then test it as best they can. Sometimes these assumptions turn out to be false. This is, of course, what happened to Kelvin. A surprising new discovery revealed that his starting assumption was false. Here's another example. It is obvious that gravity and light propagate through space. It seemed logical to 19th century scientists that something must carry gravity and light, some invisible medium that occupies space. 
They called it the ether. Then the famous Michelson-Morley experiment of 1887 showed that there is no ether. That finding surely disappointed many, but it cleared the way for scientists to discover quantum mechanics. Every field of science has examples. Could global warming depend on an assumption or assumptions that could turn out to be false? To answer, turn to this chart, which sums up the critical data on man-made global warming in one slide. It dates to 2004, but since then, carbon dioxide emissions, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and global temperatures have all risen together. So the pattern shown remains the same. Everything is proportionately higher. The three frames represent hard data, or known facts. The question for us is whether the two connections between the three data frames are assumptions that could be false. Let's take them one at a time. First, is it a fact that the carbon dioxide that has been added to the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution has come largely from burning fossil fuels? To answer, we turn to the isotopes of carbon. They allow us to fingerprint whether the carbon is coming from plants and also how old the carbon is. This chart shows that the carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere has come largely from plants. This next chart shows that the added carbon is ancient, at least hundreds of thousands of years old. But where can you find ancient plant carbon? Well, that's what fossil fuels are, ancient plants. See my website for more information about the carbon isotopes. Thus, the connection between the first two frames is not an assumption, but a known fact. We are responsible for the carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere. Second, has the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere caused the temperature rise shown in the third frame? Scientists have known since the 1850s that carbon dioxide molecules absorb heat rays, providing a heat blanket for the Earth. Without this greenhouse effect, the Earth would be 55 degrees Fahrenheit cooler on average. Thus, the greenhouse effect is the prime suspect in causing the temperature rise. Some have claimed the temperature rise is due to increased output from the sun. But as this chart shows, while temperature has risen, the sun's output has remained the same or even declined. In other words, it's not the sun. Plus, scientists have actually caught the greenhouse effect in operation. In this chart, the red color, called the forcing, refers mainly to the temperature increase. You can see how carbon dioxide and temperature rise more or less together. That is the greenhouse effect in action. Thus, the modern theory of man-made global warming does not require assumptions that could turn out to be false. On to the third way scientists have been wrong before when they were unwilling to give up their favorite theory. This is, of course, just human nature, and scientists are human too. One of the best examples is continental drift. For decades, geologists rejected the idea that continents move, largely because it violated their founding principle, that geologic changes occur not through catastrophes like colliding continents and crashing meteorites, but through steady, slow, everyday processes. It would not have been so bad if geologists had merely preferred fixed continents, but they refused even to consider the possibility of continental drift. Then in the 1950s and 1960s came irrefutable evidence from geophysics that the continents have drifted and are drifting. Though some senior geologists took the rejection of continental drift to the grave, the vast majority quickly changed their minds. The data demanded that they do so. Geology as a science did not stay wrong. Could climate scientists today be clinging to global warming when they should be adopting some better theory? No, because there is no other theory that can explain the observational facts shown in the three-frame chart a moment ago. All the hullabaloo over global warming hides the fact that those who say that it is false have no better theory or any theory to replace it.
as we have seen, the sun is not the cause, and there simply is no other theory. The fourth and last way scientists have been wrong before is simply to make a mistake and fail to correct it. Actually, scientists did once make a mistake about man-made global warming. They thought it was wrong. In 1896, a Swedish scientist named Svante Arrhenius first proposed that burning fossil fuels would cause global warming. Then, in 1900, another scientist conducted an experiment that seemed to show that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is already absorbing all the heat rays that it is capable of absorbing, so that adding more carbon dioxide would not cause more greenhouse warming. The authorities of meteorology embraced the idea that global warming is limited without thinking it through. As with continental drift, the rejection of man-made global warming lasted for more than 50 years. But again, in the 1950s and 1960s, scientists began to recognize that greenhouse warming is not self-limiting, and the more carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere, the greater the temperature rise. So once again, scientists were wrong, but they did not stay wrong. The question for us is whether there is some way in which scientists today could simply be making a mistake about man-made global warming. Today, hundreds of thousands of scientists are studying global warming. They publish more than 10,000 peer-reviewed articles per year. If man-made global warming were simply based on a mistake, you could be absolutely certain that some of these researchers would have discovered the mistake by now, and they haven't. To sum up, I am convinced that none of the ways that scientists have been wrong in the past can apply to man-made global warming today. Well, what do people do when the facts are against them, but they are unwilling to change their minds? They claim that a conspiracy faked the facts. That is where we go next in my companion video. Thanks for watching.